and welcome to the Wormhole Podcast, episode 66. I'm Charlie Place, and joining me today is the author of The Keeper of Stories, a runaway bestseller, over 10,000 ratings on Amazon. It's an absolute page turner. I moved in back a couple of hours last week to finish the last 100 pages. I don't mind saying it, it was worth every second. It was worth the later dinner. Hello, Sally Page. Hello, and thank you for those kind words. Yeah, no, it was just, I I know that you're going to read the prologue for us in a bit. And I'm really glad because it was those two pages, after those two pages, I was just like, okay, I really like this writing. Just really like it. I'm going to enjoy this book. And absolutely did. How are you? I'm very well indeed. Loving the weather. And um, yeah, it's just lovely to be talking about my book. Well, before we get there, I do want to ask, you've got some things on your website that I've just been like, I have to ask you about them. One of them is floristry. Now, I think you studied floristry and then you opened a flower shop. Can you tell us all about this? Yes, certainly. I came across it really by accident. I was working in London after leaving university and I was working in advertising and not particularly enjoying it. And I went to an evening class on floristry and I just loved it. So very naively, I decided to train and train and train, work on a Saturday and then open my own shop, which perhaps was a bit naive, but I just loved it. And I think for anybody out there who perhaps isn't using their creativity, which I hadn't really done in my career and my degree, which was in history, to suddenly do something creative, it felt like using a muscle I hadn't used for a long time and should have been using. So, yeah, it was perhaps naive, but the working with the flowers was lovely. Well, how long did you have the shop for? And did you like do weddings? Did you do different events and things? Yes, weddings, events, deliveries. I ran it for about three years. I sold it um, when my first daughter was born. I very naively thought babies would sit in the back of the shop and be quiet. (laughs) So it was... It was quite, when I look back now, I think, my goodness, what was I thinking? But it has been a lifelong love of flowers. And when my daughters were teenagers, they said, mum, go and get a job back with flowers because you clearly love it so much. And that's when I started, I just worked part time in a flower shop, but I started to photograph and write about the life of a flower shop. And the bit that really appealed to me with the stories because everybody comes in for very different reasons. It's not really the big romance gestures or the sorries that we sometimes associate with sending flowers. It's much more about friendship and hidden stories, really. Uh, so I was hooked. Well, yeah, I, I saw that you'd written books and this starting of stories and things. So would you say you yourself are a keeper of stories as such? Yes, definitely. Um, but because I, when I was writing it, it's obviously it's, it's non-fiction. I had in my mind assumed I was a, almost like a journalistic writer. And my daughter Libby, who is a, an author, and I'm going to say it now because I'm so proud of her, she's a Sunday Times best-selling author. I mean, she, from eight onwards, she literally wrote and wrote and wrote. So she and our, our family was the storyteller and wrote beautifully and I think I remember when she got her book deal I think she was staggered because I kept saying how good she was she was going but you're my mum you're going to say that (laughs) whereas obviously she clearly is a very good writer but in a way I'd pigeonholed myself I'd said oh Libby's the storyteller I do journalistic writing but actually I think you're right I had been collecting stories for a long time Well, I'm going to ask another question on that in a bit when we get to the Keeper of Stories proper. But I also do want to ask your painting. I had a look on your website. They are fantastic. How long have you been a painter and what's your favourite subjects to paint? And just tell us all about it. Yes. Well, again, rather like the writing, I hadn't, my mum said to me when I was at school, you don't do art, darling, because you have to be really good to do art. (laughs) So (laughs) I kind of gave it up. And then just gradually I started to, I try and sketch sometimes. And I actually think you probably need a reason to paint. And I organised a fundraiser for a charity where I gave people like a a little canvas and acrylic paints and the idea was that they had to paint something 
And then we would have an auction of the canvases that people had done. And we had to, whilst they were, they were sold and auctioned at a thing called the paint ball, but everybody had to come dressed as a character from a painting. Mm-hmm. And because I'd organised that, I thought, well, I better paint something. And I painted, I actually got a greetings card and copied something because I didn't really know what to paint. And I just loved it and I didn't stop. It's rather like the writing. Once I started, once I had a reason to or a real project, I was like, oh, I like this. And so I just kept painting. And funnily enough, I've painted quite a lot of flowers, but really I'm not so keen on painting flowers. I like painting people, but that is quite difficult. I think of painting as my hobby. I don't know how good I'll ever be, but I just want to keep at it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, I understand that. But yeah, you, you are certainly an all-round creative person then. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll get on to the book proper. In The Keeper of Stories, Janice cleans many homes in Cambridge. She's very highly regarded for what she does. She loves collecting stories, hearing them on the bus and to work, because her husband needs the car, and the lives of her clients. Then she's employed to work for Mrs B, who collects stories herself and wants to know Janice's. But Janice thinks she doesn't have one. And anyway, collecting is her role. And Sally, you are going to read for us from the prologue. Shall we go for it? Yes. So everyone has a story to tell. But what if you don't have a story? What then? If you are Janice, you become a collector of other people's stories. She once watched the Academy Awards acceptance speech of a famous English actor, a national treasure. In it, the national treasure described her early life as a cleaner and how, as a young hopeful, she had stood in front of other people's bathroom mirrors, holding the toilet cleaner as if it were an Oscar statue. Janice wonders what would have happened if the national treasure hadn't made it as an actor. Would she still be a cleaner like her? They're about the same age, late 40s, and she thinks they even look a bit alike. Well, she has to smile, perhaps not that similar, but with the same short build that hints of a stocky future. She wonders if the national treasure would have ended up as a collector of other people's stories too. She can't recall what started her collection. Maybe it was a life glimpsed as she rode the bus through the Cambridge countryside to work, or something in a fragment of conversation overheard as she cleaned a sink. Before long, as she dusted a sitting room or defrosted a fridge, she noticed people were telling her their stories. Perhaps they always had done, but now it is different. Now the stories are reaching out and she gathers them to her. She knows she is a receptive vessel. As she listens to the stories, the small nod she gives acknowledges what she knows to be true, that for many, she is a simple homely bowl into which they can pour their confidences. Often the stories are unexpected. At times they are funny and engaging. Sometimes they are steeped in regret and sometimes they are life affirming. She thinks maybe people talk to her because she believes in their stories. She delights in the unexpected and swallows their exaggerations whole. At home, at night, with a husband who swamps her with speeches rather than stories, she thinks about her favourites, savouring each of them in turn. Thank you. That's a a great use of tense. That's something that I think caught me first. Like it. Oh, thank you. So I'm going to actually ask something before we go to a more expected question. That national treasure you mentioned, you never give them a name. Is there a reason for it and what is their purpose? Well, it's actually, it's based on truth. Uh, In fact, all the stories, well, the vast majority of the stories that Janice collects and she sort of refers to them during the book are true. They're stories I collected because I don't think you can make up what happens in real life if you I'm sure you you've come across it Charlie where you you meet somebody and they tell you something that they've done in their past that surprises you or that they're passionate about and so mm. I like the fact that the stories are true and that the national treasure is Olivia Coleman because I watched her Oscar acceptance speech and as she was talking about being a cleaner and holding the Oscar statue like it was a toilet duck I was thinking, I wonder if there's anybody watching who that hasn't happened to, their life hasn't expanded in the way that obviously Olivia Coleman's has and that they're sat there in their sitting room watching it or in their bedroom watching it thinking with regret 
about their own life. Okay, no, that, that's interesting. And, and I mean, I was going to ask you about the individual story. So to hearing that they're true, that that's really interesting. So, I mean, moving on then to a more typical question. You've got Janice, who you know we've just been introduced to. Her herself, can you talk about her creation um, and if there's like a who or a what who inspired her, that kind of thing? Yes, um, there isn't anybody who particularly inspired her, although I do have, a, well, I did have a very, very good cleaner, Angela, but she's very unlike Janice. But I think it was more the idea of a collector of stories is what caught my imagination, the idea, because I genuinely believe everyone has a story to tell. But I also thought of somebody in their life where they feel they don't have a story or they're hiding a story. So this idea of collecting other people's stories also as a way to make sense of their life, perhaps at a time when they're struggling. And so it really came out of that emotion and those thoughts rather than necessarily imagining her particular character. She grew from that. Mm hmm. Well, no, that, that's interesting. I, I did wonder because I know that I found when I started the book, I thought, well, Janice feels like a vessel. She's a character, but she feels more like someone who is there as a kind of a device as such. Mm. And then it takes a, a, a while, which I think I think is, is part of your point almost. But then mm. you do start to hear more of her and start to put it together as a character herself very yeah. slowly, which is something that was very interesting. But yeah, I, I definitely did find her hard to picture first. And then by the end, I'm like, I can see her completely. I think to start with, she's hiding a lot. Well, she is. She's hiding a lot. So she's doing the task of collecting to keep all the other stuff at bay, I think. I also very much wanted her to be somebody who was underestimated, because I think there are many people in life who are underestimated. So that was definitely part of her, her character that from the very beginning that she actually is an awesome woman but people some of the people she meets don't really appreciate that mrs b definitely does in the end but some people don't really get her mm -hmm. in terms of the general kind of whole i suppose how important in telling your story were the other characters other than janice uh in terms of this kind of subject were they more function or important in themselves Oh, no, they're definitely important in themselves because it's also a book about friendship. Mm. So they have to be people who she has built proper relationships with. So the other characters were kind of, in a way, easier to write because, to me, they really existed, you know, from Geordie to Fiona and Adam. And, I mean, all of them, they they all have a a real sense of being to me, which is a great thing about being a writer, you can surround yourself by, you know, these wonderful people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So, I mean, did you plot the book out or did it just kind of flow as such? I'm very much a planner. My daughter Libby is a, she flows more with a bit of planning. I plan a lot with then a bit of flowing. And there were times when I would be writing and there's one point where Janice loses control and I had literally had no idea she was going to do that. And I could feel her angst. And as I'm writing it, then I just wrote what was in her head. But I didn't know she was going to do that. So there are bits where, you know, I definitely plan, but then sometimes it just takes over, which is then a real joy. Yeah, no, that, that's fascinating. I mean, that bit, you know, I, I didn't necessarily know if you planned or not. And I, and I don't like to assume because people have surprised me so much when I talk to them about it. But that bit I would have thought was something that you had thought of. So that that is it's interesting. And maybe that's maybe there's something in there about why it works so well um, that it, it just came. Can I ask about Mrs. B? Can you tell us about her as a character, the same sort of thing as Janice, the creation, etc.? cetera? Um, I think with Mrs. B... I wanted sort of a bit of grit in there, so a grit in your oyster. You want a bit of somebody who's, you know, she's a clearly a good woman, but again, underestimated because of her age, I think, but also holding quite a lot of anger and angst. So I just loved her. I, I really liked her. <laughs> so she was a joy to be with. So she was easy to write because her voice was so clear in my head. And she was quite manipulative. You know, she's trying to find out 
Janice's story and she'll go to any lengths to do that. And that just made me smile as I was writing it. (laughs) I definitely had a good picture in my head of what she looked like. You know, she's so fully formed and everything and her life is so interesting. I did love that you had her as a collector herself and someone who's kind of like more confident, like I'm going to get this story out Mm. of Janice. And I mean, on this, you use the Arabian Nights. Can you talk about this more, about using this, the reasons and, and, and such and such? It was a very, it was a central part of the book. And originally my working title for the book was Scheherazade, because once I'd thought about Janice having, uh, having hidden something, I knew the story of Scheherazade in that, you know, somebody telling a story and leaving it open so that you want to hear the next instalment. So I thought that's a good way because I was thinking, why would Janice go back to this woman who's quite cranky, if we're honest? Why mm. would she go back and clean for her? And so I always wanted that thing of, because it was about telling stories, I thought Scheherazade is such a wonderful way to incorporate that. But as my publisher pointed out, and my agent pointed out, you know, not everybody knows Scheherazade's story. And actually as a title for a book, it could be, put people off because they'd go well I have no idea what that's about and I do think the keeper of stories is a much stronger title but Scheherazade was always a, an important part of the book. Mm, no fascinating I mean yeah I saw it as, as as what you'd used it for but I had no sort of idea it might be even bigger than than what mm. we see in the book no that, that's that's interesting I mean furthering this then you have the story of who Mrs B calls Becky. Yes. Reading it, I did think maybe this is a made-up story that's been made in order to tell your story. And then, of course, looking it up, it, it's real. And it's based on, I think her name was Marguerite. And I suppose what I wanted to ask specifically on this is Janice never asks, she never wants to know the name of the person who is Becky. Does this help Janice in any way, this not knowing? Does it help her progression as a character? It's not so much helping her progression as confirming how important her relationship is with Mrs B, because Mrs B tells her Becky's story. And so if it becomes Marguerite in her mind, it is what's happened between her and Mrs B, and it will always be Becky. It sort of preserves that process, that journey they've been on together, where Mrs. B used Becky's story, like Scheherazade, telling her bits, also using it as a way to to see what Janice reacts to, because she's trying to find out her story. So she, as she's telling the story, she's watching her to see various aspects of the story. Do they, you know, do they make Janice wince? Do they, does she get a flinch? Because If she does, Mrs. B will be in there (laughs) to find out more. To be honest, my background is years and years ago, I did history at university and I do read quite a lot of history. And so this book and the other books I've written are contemporary novels with a historical line thread in them. So they're contemporary novels, but there is always a historical thread. And I just thought... Marguerite's story was astounding when I came across it and I wanted to include it in a book. Well, I'm going to ask more about that in a second. I'm just going to hop on your history thing there because you've said it at the start as well. What's your favourite period of history to study, etc.? Oh, um, goodness. I did Victorian and Edwardian social history. I like everybody. I love the Tudors. Hmm. Uh, but I think more... Edwardian and that turn of the century, I find fascinating. And the and very much to do with women and women's roles. I find that very, very interesting. Okay, yeah. So seeing more of the uh the creation of the book here, it's that's lovely. So okay, then I'll go back to um Marguerite and Edward the Eighth, the abdicated king. So I mean, I've read about Edward and I think lots of people know about him and Wallace Simpson and everything that yeah. went on there. But this is a story that I know I hadn't heard of before, and I'm not sure if it's widely known. Can you tell us how you came to know about this story and Mm. why you came to use this story itself and what it was about it that interested you? 
I came across it. I was reading a book about Edward VIII, and it is literally a paragraph in there. They talk about his early life, and this was his first real love when he was the Prince of Wales, his first mistress, and he didn't treat her very well. But he was also very indiscreet. He always wrote lots and lots of letters. And when he didn't treat her very well, she threatened him with the letters. And it went, he went into a complete flat spin about this. Because in the letters, it's well documented now that he criticised the king. He was living a very flamboyant lifestyle when the First World War was raging, which is when part of their relationship uh, went on. And so the damage the letters could have been done was enormous. In my view, I don't think she was ever going to use the letters. She was a woman who her life was funded by men like Edward. And so if she blackmailed him, you know, she could easily have lost all the people who supported her, often giving her a pension, you know, in her older life. When I read about it in more detail, the, the history that I could investigate had been written by men. And they were quite critical of Marguerite and they viewed her as a gold digger. And I kept thinking of Vanity Fair and Becky Sharp and just like when a woman literally has her back to the wall, when you are in terrible circumstances, which is where Marguerite came from, you know, you do anything. And I think it was a very, quite a male chauvinistic view of her. So I wanted to give her a voice and say, Yes, she was She was certainly a character and, you know, she had a hell of a temper. But actually, she was looking after herself in a way a man would look after himself. And the story where she splits from Edward and then years later, she actually kills her husband in the Savoy. She shoots him dead. There is no doubt she shot her husband dead. He was an Egyptian. He called himself a prince, but say a very aristocratic man from Egypt. She shot him dead. She was seen moments after shooting him dead. And then she was taken to court and suddenly everything changed. And I would certainly suggest that the letters came into play at that point and she was found not guilty. You, I mean, I, I saw it when I researched the information and the story of Marguerite, but you have kind of woven your own additions of the story as as Mrs B says herself about changing stories and stuff brought it into something I suppose Janice would more likely relate to. It's that thing of I think one of the quotes in in the book is you should always leave a, a story better than you found it. Mm. I tried particularly the historical thing I tried to be historically accurate based on other people's writing about it their research documentaries that were made but you know, this is a novel. So I wanted it to be solid, but I allowed myself a bit of artistic license. I'm definitely glad that you've included it as well. It's, I mean, I've read Wendy Holden's The Duchess recent, in recent months that was about mm. Wallace Simpson. Mm. And from there, I went back to the Wikipedia page on, on Edward VIII. And I don't think there's a mention of Marguerite there, which is just fascinating in itself. Mm. So I'm going to have to ask about... Uh, Decius, is that how you would say it, the dog? Decius. Now, the Decius. big, big, uh, yeah, because actually you're saying it right, because one of my lovely girl, Emma, at One More Chapter at HarperCollins, I think it's her flatmate as a classicist. So we've had lots of debate about how you previously would have said Decius, and then nowadays you say Decius, but in my mind he was always Decius. So I can't say him any other than but Decius. So he will always be Decius to me. <laughs> <laughs> how how do I bring him in here? I mean, he he's obviously he's fantastic, and you've got his humanization personification, I suppose, by Janice, where he is he's this lovely dog, and you can imagine him being really really happy with Janice. And then, of course, she's got this kind of inner monologue for him where he swears so much. I had no idea he was going to swear. I just I thought of a dog because I thought, why would she work for these hideous people? because she's a good cleaner. So I was like, ah, a dog, a dog that she loves, who she has to walk. So that was okay. So Decius came along. When Desi had started swearing, obviously in Janice's mind, I literally had no idea how bad his language was going to be. He, <laughs> he, just, he just took over. 
he just made me laugh. I mean, he had a life of his own. He was quite happy doing his own thing. And he was very easy to write. But I did. I literally had no idea how foul his language would be. <laughs> and I like that Janice doesn't really either, which is, is funny in itself. Yeah. I mean, he's he's effectively very important in helping Janice get to where she gets to. Why did you feel that she kind of needed Decius to to help her with that? Why this dog? I think because, um, as you said, it gives her a monologue and it's a monologue you wouldn't hear because it it's her more sweary, because Janice isn't a woman who would be verbally swearing and things like that. So I needed that side of her to come out that she is really frustrated and quite a few people piss her off a lot. So Decius was voicing it, but of course it's Janice's voice we're hearing. Mm -hmm. It's just the two sides of Janice then, yeah. Yeah. Do we ever find out Mrs. Yeah, yeah, yeah's name? I don't think we do, do we? We're not worthy of knowing her name. She, <laughs> she doesn't deserve it. <laughs> I've met women like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just like, I just met some people like that. So she was great. Again, it, it was very easy to write her. <laughs> <laughs> Well, going towards spoilers for a moment, Tiberius, I think we can see, doesn't really love his dog much, really. He's all about, all oh, this pedigree dog, this pedigree dog. Well, Mrs. Yeah, 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 Miss Decius. Oh, not in the slightest. Not in the slightest. She didn't want to walk him. I think it was all, you know, Tiberius bought a pedigree dog and that was that. No, I don't think so in the least. Yeah, fair enough. No, I was, I was trying to work her out because she does have these moments where she seems to be understanding that there seems to be more that needs to go on as such with Mrs B and things like that. On these other people, you've got Fiona, you've got Adam, but you've got loads of people's stories and Fiona and Adam's is is hard to read. You know, it's a tough story. They're still working through it. And you yeah. show all the difficulties that Fiona has as a mother of trying to work through her own grief as well as helping Adam. Mm. What was important about including their story to the overall narrative? Um, I think when I was thinking about stories, there were many threads that I had as I was planning. And one of them was, can you define your own story? Can you choose your own story? And when something really traumatic has happened in your life, do you get choice over what comes next? And what defines you? When, particularly when something really traumatic has happened, does that define you? So I think those were things I wanted to explore in the book. And obviously those are the characters that help me to do that. Hmm. That's interesting to know. And also it's a very defining story. I mean, all the stories are interesting, obviously, but that is obviously a certain definition to it as such. If we stay away from the other things here, what is next in terms of what you're writing? <laughs> well, the good thing about not having been picked up for ages and ages is that I've got an awful lot of other books in the drawer. So... I've been writing since 2016. I didn't get an agent till 2019. She couldn't sell the first book that she took me up on. Then she did sell The Keeper of Stories, but that was 2020. And so it took a couple of years for it to come out. And during lockdown, I wrote two books. I've got two books ready to go, which are out with my publisher and other publishers at the moment. And then I've got another book, which I really love, but I know it does need a bit of work. So I've got quite a few things I want to be working on and they will all be contemporary novels, but with a historical thread running through it. And I can absolutely say I will never give you a unhappy ending. I may not tie everything up neatly, but I just couldn't write a book with a sad ending. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like knowing that you've got more than one. That's brilliant. Oh, yeah. What is it about needing the happy ending as opposed to maybe a, a more sad ending? Oh, my goodness. Life's hard enough, isn't it? I just think, you know, I think the the keeper of stories is about, you know, how ordinary is extraordinary. But it's also about hope, which I genuinely believe in, not in a cheesy, everything will be happy ever after Hollywood sort of way. But I just believe there's so much good out there and people doing their best. And that's what I really motivates me to write, to go, you know, come on, we're, there are lots of good things out there that people do for each other. Mm. And so there are a lot of stories 
in that that I kind of would like to tell. Yeah, I mean, for me, given how satisfying and wonderful the Keeper of Stories is, it's it's nice to know that there is that positivity coming from your pen, effectively, later on. And can you tell us about your fountain pens, your plumes? Oh, yes, yes. I love fountain pens. I always liked writing with fountain pens, but I found that they were very masculine in the sense that they're, you know, racing car green or black or burgundy. And I mean, that's being terribly gender specific, which of course I shouldn't be. But what I couldn't find were very traditional fountain pens, heavyweight traditional fountain pens that were beautiful colours, which of course men, women, anybody can like, but I couldn't find that. And so I designed my own and started my business and it's an online business and you know it's very small I have 12 different colors from sort of aubergine to duck egg blue to pistachio to ballet pink bright orange and it's just a joy for me and it has been my you know my business and now I will be running it in the background it's you know it's an online business that I can keep going as I write fantastic fantastic and I will include links to your your pens there for listeners Sally, is there anything else that we've maybe not mentioned or not covered enough that you would like to add to the end of this podcast? Not really. You've asked some really interesting questions. I would just say I am so grateful to the readers who've really taken this book to their hearts because I get such lovely reviews and it is, I'm very happy to say, selling really, really well. So you know, authors, you never know whether your book will resonate. And it's an absolute joy to me that people are enjoying it. Well, thank you for your kind words. And yeah, I mean, as a reader, I can say I can completely see why people are enjoying it. There's something very special about your book, there is. Thank you. So Sally, it's been wonderful having you on. I have enjoyed every second of The Keeper of Stories. You know, it was two hours of dinner set back. It was also sleep set back. It was chores set back I mean in a way it's kind of good that I finished the book because now you know I'm, I'm back on track but it was just so thrilling and lovely to read a story that was just so positive and having you on thank you for coming on the podcast today well thank you very much for asking me I've really enjoyed it as always links to purchase the book in this case the keeper of stories are in the episode description thank you very much for listening please do share this episode with anyone you think would be interested in hearing it. The Wormhole Podcast, episode 66, was recorded on the 14th of July and published on the 8th of August, 2022. Music and production by Charlie Place.